Escape rooms are a fascinating concept. I love the idea of being trapped in a fairly small area and only using what limited supplies and clues you have at your disposal to solve puzzles and get out. It adds stakes to a normal puzzle-solving situation. But today, we aren't looking at an escape room, at least not a traditional one. Don't Escape is a trilogy of games that are essentially anti-escape rooms. Your goal is to use your resources to keep yourself locked up, whether that be because you're infected with a virus or because the apocalypse is going on outside and you need to be locked away safely in a bunker. The trilogy were all originally released in the early 2010s on Newgrounds. This means that they're relatively short, but it honestly works to their advantage by creating these thrilling experiences that you can pick up and complete on a whim. I'm stumbling my way through the final weeks of an internship as of writing this, so I figured it'd be the perfect short series to cover in between workdays. Let's get right into it. In the first game, you play as a man about to turn into a werewolf. A full moon is approaching soon, and you don't want to kill people, so you set your resolve to use everything in and around your little shack to restrain yourself before you can harm anyone. The game is shockingly elaborate. You have a lot you need to take into account to succeed. There are many different endings, most of which are different variations of you failing and killing people. I'm going to walk through the thought process my friends and I had when we played through it. We spawn in a relatively isolated cabin, starting off by shoving this bookshelf in front of the door and grabbing the rope from the wall to tie the player up. Unfortunately, tied up people can't really do a whole lot, so we removed the restraints and looked around further. The house has four sides, the entrance with the front door and a shelf, a cooking area with a fireplace and a pot, a seating area with a table, wall hook, and chest, and a sleeping area with a dresser, bed, and window. You can also exit and look around, which we will try out later. Your inventory is a bar at the top of your screen. Whenever you find an item like this flask here, it'll go straight to the top. The player's face is in the top corner, and you can use items on yourself by dragging and dropping them. The final icon is an hourglass, which you can use to skip ahead to nighttime when everything goes down. I quite like that there isn't an actual timer on this. You get the stress of not knowing if you've done everything you need to with no time limit to indicate how long it should have taken you. It creates stress through self-doubt instead of through a time crunch. The second and third games will change this, but not in a bad way. For now, let's keep searching around. This cabin has a lot of stuff laying about. We find a key, a tinderbox, and a dried herb. I haven't introduced the gang of miscreants that I tend to record with nowadays, so let's do that real quick. These are the friends joining me for these escapades. First, we have Gino, our resident lovable lunatic that is better at video games than the entire group combined. Very awesome guy. Next, we have Aaron, our master of obscure media who is simultaneously one of the kindest and most hilariously sarcastic people that I have ever met. Absolute champion. Finally, we have Cyan Cora, one of the most incredible artists I've ever met and genuinely the most thoughtful person. She was doing taxes the whole time we played through this, so I'm sure our incessant screaming helped a lot. Gino suggests that we try and open the locked chest with our key, but it unfortunately doesn't work. Then Aaron suggests we lock the front door with it, which works like a charm. Gino mentions that we've been getting quite a few things that look like potion ingredients, but it isn't much use to us unless we can find some firewood to get that pot boiling. We maneuver outside, grabbing an axe, some firewood, and a mushroom for our witch's brew. We use the wood to start a fire and throw in the ingredients, drinking the resulting mixture. It tastes bad, but there's no sign of if it worked or not. After taking our axe to the table, we have an assortment of scrap wood left, but nothing to secure it with and board up the window or door. At this point, we are completely stumped. We don't have a hammer or anything else to interact with, so I made the executive decision to end the run and hit the hourglass to see if we could get any other information from a failed ending. We tie the player up and press the hourglass. Our herbal mixture didn't work, but we learned that it's supposed to be a potion of weakening. The werewolf easily tore apart the rope and smashed through the window, going on a killing spree. After murdering seven victims, a group of monster hunters arrived, ending the slaughter once and for all. We did end up getting some useful information here. First and foremost, we learned about the stamina bar. During the ending, a bar is displayed at the top of the screen that goes down the more that the werewolf struggles. We only got it to 75% capacity with our rope in the window lock, so we have some serious planning to do to make security four times as effective during this next attempt. Upon restarting, Gino noticed an extra item right off the bat. There was a chain on the roof with somewhat of a finicky hitbox, so we didn't see it before. Inside, we discover a loose floorboard hiding a secret storage area with a piece of meat and a spice for the potion. We then find the key to the chest under the bed, which reveals the hammer and nails that we need to board up the window. I feel like we should put the meat on the hook. Yeah, no, the meat on the hook. Yeah, and so then go way, get the potion. Yeah. 
and then see if you can pour the potion onto me. Aaron brings up a good point here. If we drink the potion and then wait for nighttime to transform, its effects would most likely wear off before it can be truly useful. However, if we drench the meat in it and hang it on the wall, the werewolf would willingly consume the potion of weakness to get to the meat. We mix all our potion ingredients into the pot, hanging up the meat and pouring the potion on top of it. We lock the door, cover it in the bookshelf, lock the window, hammer the planks over the top of it, then tie both the chain and the rope around ourselves. It's time for attempt number two. This time it takes substantially more stamina to get rid of both the chain and the rope. The laced meat worked like a charm. It took the last of the werewolf's stamina to get the window unlocked, preventing anyone from getting hurt. With that, we have won. I like this little game a lot. It was short, simple, but fun. It's everything you could really want from an older Flash game. Every mistake that we made was 100% our own fault, which is exactly what you want from a puzzle game. This was only the start of the series, though. The second game would make some pretty big changes that the series would follow for the rest of the trilogy. In the second game, you play as a survivor during the zombie apocalypse. You have one friend with you, Bill, who was bitten during a recent attack and will be turning any day now. You find an abandoned building to hide in, but the zombies will arrive by evening and you need to be ready. Unlike the first game, there are five separate locations around the map. This one is actually timed, but not in the bad way. Instead of having a timer, you have a certain amount of hours until nightfall, and each action that you take will take a certain amount away from that. If you get tools or the help of other survivors, you can greatly speed things up and get more done. Let's say it takes three hours to set up an electric fence. If you have two friends with you, it'll take 45 minutes. We start off by grabbing a shovel from the corner and searching through the dumpster outside, finding a key and some wire. There's a generator for an electric fence nearby. There are four other locations to explore. There's the gas station, the shop, the church, and the site of a car crash. We went to the store first and found a guy named Jeremy alongside a chained up shopping cart, a drawing on the wall, and a rolled up sheet of fence. Inside the store, there's a camera without batteries as well as a bottle of alcohol. There's a room in the floor with a zombie inside. We take it out with a shovel, but the tool breaks in the process. However, now we can get a pair of glasses from the floor, giving them to Jeremy and adding him to our group of survivors. We move on to the crash site, finding a gun next to a car crash. Next, we go to the church, finding a bag of concrete and a stack of bricks. Both these and the fence from earlier are too cumbersome to carry without equipment to help us, but the shopping cart that we would want to use from before is still restrained so we just don't have access. Inside the church is a pastor who has lost all of his hope. After offering both violence and alcohol with no success, we move to the gas station. At the gas station, we find a gas can as well as some ammunition. Inside there are batteries, a coin, and some painkillers that will come in handy for Bill. We break down the door with an axe to find a rubber hose that we can use to siphon gas into the can. We go back and give Bill the painkillers as well as some alcohol so he passes out peacefully. We siphon gas from the police car in the crash for the electric fence. We try to take a photo of some religious memorabilia to show the pastor, but no faith is restored. We go back to the original building, fueling the generator and attaching the wires to the electric fence before returning to the store. Sure, you could take a picture of something. <gasps> Wait, take a picture of the fucking drawing on the straw and the thing and show it to the priest. I'm a fucking genius. Heck yeah. You have such a big, beautiful brain, you know? And now we can get the priest. This worked like a charm, earning us the trust of the priest who can now help us cut down the time it takes to do things even more. Aaron suggests we shoot open the hatch in the abandoned building, revealing a bunker that we can hide inside to stay safe from the zombie horde. Using the axe and our newly acquired manpower, we go to the forest by the road and gather some pointy sticks to create a trap with. We set them up outside of our base before moving back to the shop to try and get our hands on that shopping cart. Do we also still have that coin? Yeah. Wait! Yeah. Oh my god! What? You're supposed to use it on the carts. Because that's what you do, you put money to... Was this made by a British... Is that not like a British thing? I think that's a British thing. This is probably made by a British guy. Okay, so what you do is um, shopping carts slash trolleys. You put a coin in to unlock the chain so you can take it out. And then what you do is you take it back, plug the chain back, and you get the coin back. Sure enough, Aaron is right. We grab the cart as well as all the heavy supplies. We would have used the shovel to mix up the sand and concrete to create a barricade, but we broke our shovel earlier when taking out the zombie. Because of this, it takes a lot longer to break up the window. We don't have enough time to set up the electric fence, so we move to the building for our final stand. One gunshot later, Bill is no longer a threat and we can lock ourselves in. 50 undead arrive. Because of our gunshots, 10 more are added to that count. The zombies started to invade our base, and we took out most of them. There were still some left when they broke into the bunker we were hiding inside. Now, I would love to tell you what happened, but the text goes off screen and we couldn't figure out how to see the rest. 
From what we can tell, the zombies ate both Jeremy and the pastor while we ran away, barely escaping. So that was our first attempt. The sequel is a lot better than the original for multiple reasons. Having a set amount of time but not a real-life timer is a great strategic game mechanic, and I love how many different ways you can try to survive. The larger scale was great to explore, and interacting with the other characters was fascinating. We had such a good time with this entry that we played through it for a second time to try and get our other friends out alive. First, we grabbed all the materials and set the wires up on the electric fence. We were more efficient with our time, getting all the materials and survivors we needed far quicker. This time, we shot the zombie in the store to save our shovel for breaking up the window. We give Bill the painkillers but not the alcohol so that he can help us set up the trap, bricks, and fence. We activate the newly rebuilt fence, giving Bill the alcohol so that he passes out before taking an axe to the skull. We lock ourselves in the bunker, this time escaping with all of our lives intact. Don't Escape 3 handles a fairly drastic change in scenery. This one takes place on a starship, the UEFS Horizon. We play as the pilot. We awaken an airlock with the computer counting down. After fiddling with the controls for a bit, we activate a safety protocol and we are able to enter back inside. There are digital mission logs scattered about the starship, detailing a mission locating another ship that was torn into pieces. The only thing remaining aboard were corpses covered in mysterious glowing crystals. It seems that the team aboard the UEFS Horizon took it upon themselves to investigate this matter. One of the crewmates, Rick, said that a single crystal was left there. We'll have to check it out later on. This time we have a map, which is super helpful reference material. This game is in a first-person perspective, so having this helps you keep track not only of your location, but of what rooms will be affected by your actions down the line. We move to the lab, finding a fuse box with a missing fuse outside of it. The lab contains another note, some antibiotics, and a system that we can use to combine materials together to make solvents. We have the recipe to make a crystal dissolvent as well as an explosive amplifier. We only found one flask, though. To the left of the lab is a locked door. There's a manual release valve, but we need to cut through the metal to get to it. There's a corpse in the hallway outside the crew quarters that we choose to ignore for now. The crew quarters are pitch dark, so we move to the navigation room instead. Here we find the captain dead, and we don't have his keycard to gain access to the consoles. We can, however, turn on the lights in the crew quarters. Inside is yet another corpse. We take the knife from their back, raid the vending machine of food and alcohol, then move to the bathroom where we pick up some detergent. We find that what looked like a rubber hose next to the corpse is actually a freaking plasma torch. We use the knife to pull a vent cover off the wall, discovering a key that we tried to use in the navigation room. We weren't able to find anything, though. Uh, you are turning into a psychopath. What are you talking about? I didn't do anything. You just tried to stab a corpse. I did nothing of the sort. I don't think he did that. Oh, hey, champ. We find yet another mission log describing the damage to the ship. It's so severe that all we can do is take the escape pod to freedom. This is when we noticed a new panel on our data pad. Next to the map is a security camera section, but it's currently not functioning. We return to the lab and use the key on the locker, retrieving a bottle of acid and some protective glasses, putting the ladder on. We actually missed a section of the room in the crew quarters containing plant cells and fuel for the plasma torch. There's another door here, but it seems to be locked. Another door. Oh. 7575. <laughs> no. Try, no, try it, try it. All right, try all right. it, all right, all right. Oh, maybe that was a mistake. Dude, do you did, Gino. Oops. With our newly fueled plasma torch, we use the manual release valve, finding some toxic fumes permeating the room behind. We grab a spacesuit from the airlock and use it to get through safely. Here is a life support control system that we can activate to quadruple our survival time. There's a 3D printer here as well, which will come in handy later. We use a toolbox to fix the ventilation system and clear out the gas. We return to the airlock with our suit on and leave the ship, tying ourselves to the craft with a rope. Here we find the crystal mentioned in the earlier mission log, and we take it back with us. Back in the crew quarters, we fill the flask with the stabbed man's blood, returning to the lab and mixing it together with plant cells and the antibiotic to create the crystal dissolvent. This can then be put in the sprinkler system and used to dissolve the crystals blocking the door in the room next to the lab. Not all of them disappear, but we can get inside now to grab a mission log and some explosives. The new log details that the crystals are alive and will attach to a living host, replacing the organic material with more of itself over time. They're most likely what caused the destruction of the other ship. We head back to the printer, creating an igniter and attaching it to the explosives. Then, Gel popped into chat. Hello? I don't, don't escape. 
Yeah, ben, Ben's recording right now. Yes. Oh. We're in recording Hi, viewers! Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jell is our resident living, breathing cartoon character. He's a super talented writer and content creator, and you better go follow his Twitch in the description right now. Next, we use the lab to create an explosive amplifier and pour it onto the bomb. Finally, we throw that crystal we got from outside into the room where they were originally contained. We hop into the escape pod and leave the ship behind. But by doing so, we failed. We didn't see what was behind the keypad door. We didn't find the truth. We didn't see an option to detonate the bomb after we left, so everything was still intact. And most importantly, we escaped in a series called Don't Escape. Something's clearly wrong here. We started the game over, determined to get into that final room. This time, we made an interesting discovery. Remember the security system? We tried it out in the crystal room. Wait, go into the crystal room and use your pad. Just use the security cams fucking everywhere. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. There you go. Yeah. It's like a five or night. Oh, oh, <laughs> it's pre ah! It is oh among us. us. Ah! <laughs> oh, they're hugging. Oh, oh, oh they're doing. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, <see. laughs> I don't think it's hugging anymore. Oh, hey! Oh. 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 There you go. Oh, there you go. Footage. All right, let's keep looking. Let's go try everywhere. every room. Everywhere. Yeah. Oh, you can use it where the fucking corpses are. Uh, <laughs> we need to find every single security recording to get the rest of the digits to this code. Now we have our code and we can enter the final room. As we go inside, we see the astronaut that has been killing everyone. Except the suit is empty. Heck, the suit has our name tag on it. After letting out quite the bloody cough, we learn that the crystals are growing inside of us. They took our body over and used it to kill the crew. We can't leave this ship alive. This time, we detonate the bomb with ourselves inside the ship, leaving absolutely nothing behind. Every crystal, every body, every ship fragment, all gone. The world is now safe. I honestly think that these are a great series of short games. They don't overstay their welcome, and each one has a good understanding of what it wants to be. The first game was a simple parody of an escape room. It seemed like more of an experiment with a small map and the shortest overall runtime. The second one stepped things up quite a lot, and it's my favorite out of the three. Being forced to keep track of your time through what activities you do and being able to use other characters to your advantage was great to keep things interesting. While I absolutely miss the game mechanics of the second one, I really like the narrative aspects that they added for the third. As a standalone game, the third is a great Newgrounds title, but it's one of the weaker in the series mechanically. I will absolutely come back to these in the future if I'm ever looking for some small games to play in a voice chat. They're charming, interesting, and efficient. If you want to check them out and try and get all the endings, I'll leave the links to all three of them in the description. I hope to see you all again. Have a great rest of your day.